Miko Pellet is the son of General Matty Pellet, a leader in the 1967 war who also fought in the War of Independence in 1948. Like his father, Pellet is an advocate for an end to the occupation of Palestine. As an Israeli, he offers an insider's perspective on just how far Israel has strayed from its democratic principles. His observations are now collected in a book, The General's Son, The Journey of an Israeli in Palestine. I remember, I remember I was only a young soldier, maybe six months into my service, when we began participating in simple security uh, missions. And I'll, I'll read from the, I'll read a quote from my book. We began participating in simple security missions that included patrolling the streets of Palestinian towns like Ramallah, the old city of Jerusalem, and remote villages in the West Bank. Not once did I have a clue why we were there or what we were securing. All I ever saw were civilians going about their business. When we were in the more remote areas, we saw nothing but the typical pastoral landscape of the West Bank, the rolling hills, the terraces with grapevines and olive trees. I remember getting prepped once before a patrol in Ramallah. We were given batons and handcuffs. In those days, there was no uprising, there was really no protest to speak of, there was no intifada, and we were a small, highly specialized infantry unit. And I remember thinking to myself, why are we in a city full of civilians? And what are we supposed to do with these batons and handcuffs? Our lieutenant briefed us before we were sent to Ramallah. He said we were to walk up and down the streets, and that if anyone so much as looked at, so much as looked at us, we were to beat them, or as he put it, break every bone in their body. This seemed to me to be a pretty extreme thing to say. To break people's bones just because they looked at us? How could they avoid looking at us? We were a platoon of fully armed infantry soldiers in a city full of civilians. The question is always raised, how is it that Israeli soldiers that are so supposedly educated in a civilian, democratic, pluralistic society, how is it they become so brutal? How is it they're able to execute these orders? And how is it they're able to, um, to enforce the occupation on the Palestinian people? I remember a friend saying to me once, having read something that I wrote, you make them seem like Nazis or something. Well, I don't make them seem like Nazis, and I don't make them seem like anything else. What I do is I describe a situation where these very nice young men and women or I should say, otherwise very nice, educated young men and women execute the most horrific things against a civilian population. A civilian population that is completely unarmed, that has never had a military, never had an army. I remember some, reading something that was written by Sharif al-Musa once, where he described it like this. Rationalization of the necessity for a Jewish majority in Israel requires the Arabs to be pictured darkly bent annihilation of the Jews, and is culturally incapable of forming democratic, pluralistic systems. Add on to that what has recently been published um, about the Israeli, Israeli textbooks, textbooks that are used in Israeli high schools. And again, I quote, what Israeli children or Israeli kids in high school learn, or what they see in their textbook, is the Arab with a camel in an Alibaba dress they, describe them as, they are described as vile and deviant and criminal, people who, know, who don't pay taxes, people who live off the state, people who don't want to develop. The only representation of Palestinians is as refugees, primitive farmers, and terrorists. You never see a Palestinian child or a doctor or a teacher or an engineer, again, in the Israeli textbooks. And this is in stark contrast to what Palestinians really are. Whether in Israel or in other countries, Palestinians have always been very a peaceful civil society, hardworking, highly educated people, um, people with a sense of social and political responsibility, very active, um, and 
these qualities, these very positive qualities, have been masked by a campaign that intentionally focuses on the militant minority that is by no means typical or characteristic or represents Palestinians in general. And for decades, the reality is that Palestinian leaders have demonstrated nothing but willingness to reach an agreement and to resolve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, in Israel, generally, Palestinian, Palestinian national aspirations are ridiculed. Uh, the claim is always made that the, the whole notion of Palestinian identity is a new thing. It was something that evolved after 1967. Palestinian, the Palestinians who are Israeli citizens are referred to as the Arabs of Israel, which is an in interesting term because it serves several pur purposes. First of all, this associates the Palestinians themselves who are Israeli citizens from the land. In other words, the sense is that these people really have no national aspirations and they actually have no connection to the land. So anything they say about their connection to the land must be, a, must be false. And besides that, there are 22 Arab countries, and since they're just Arabs with no particular other identity, they can just go and live in any other Arab country. And this is the sense. Um, it creates a misleading impression that this is, again, just a transient uh, population. Another thing that this suggests is that they are living in Israel um, and therefore at the pleasure of the Israeli Jews. And therefore they must be obedient, they must, therefore they must be grateful, and if they misbehave or they protest or they don't like it, then we will take away their identity, we will take away their passport, we will take away their ID as Israelis, their citizenship, and they can go somewhere else. Um, I believe it was Ahmed Tibi who spoke in the Knesset one day and he compared the word that Arabs use or the Arab word for nationality uh, when, the, when there was a debate about taking away Palestinian uh, citizenship or the Israeli citizenship for, from Palestinians and he said the word in Arabic is Watani and Watani is a person who belongs to the land, to the homeland. So his claim was, well you can take our passports, you can take our citizenship but you're not going to take our connection to the land. And it's a, it's a very, very interesting distinction. Um, and again, the, the, the Israeli campaign, the Israeli idea is to take away the connection between the people and the land. They are transient and they happen to be here at our pleasure and if we don't like it, and if they don't like it, they can just go or we can send them away. But the notion of Watani as somebody who can, who's connected to the land is a very po powerful one as opposed to citizenship, which is a piece of paper, uh, which is really meaningless. An important distinction, I think, to make is to stop calling the domination of Palestine by Israel an occupation. Um, occupation seems like something that's um, temporary. But when you, we look at the Zionist education system, when we look at the way the Zionist state treats the Palestinians, both in, and in the West Bank and Gaza and within Israel, we see that there's a greater picture here. There's something here that's far more reaching than just an occupation. And people are often afraid to use the term ethnic cleansing. But the term ethnic cleansing is really the one thing that describes the process more than anything else. And it's probably fair to say that ethnic cleansing is the process that has been going on since the establishment of the State of Israel, probably a little bit before that. And it is still ongoing today. So trying to solve the issue of the occupation is by no means going to solve the issue of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Now, when we look at the process that goes on of settlements in the West Bank, for example, typically Palestinians will be prohibited from entering their own lands. The crops will die. After some time, the Israeli army declares the land um, state land, since nobody's cultivating the land. And once the state becomes state land, then we can do what we want, and then the settlements are built. Now this, is not, now, this is happening in the West Bank every day, all the time. But this is exactly what happened all over Israel. This is how Israel was established. Palestinians were sent off their land. They were not permitted to return. Their crops died. The, the land was not cultivated. And Jewish towns and cities and parks and so on were built in their place. So what is happening in the West Bank today is really no different than the process that took place 60 years ago when the state of Israel was established. Now, when we enter into that equation, 
the education system. When we enter into that equation, the treatment of Palestinians who are citizens of other countries, U.S. citizens who try to come and visit, and the harassment that they have to go through, spending hours at the airport before they're allowed to enter, spending hours at the airport before they leave, and creating an experience that most people would not want to repeat. When we enter into the same equation, again, the rules and the regulations that Palestinians within the West Bank have to go through just to, just to live, just to travel, just to conduct their business, just to get married. Um, the complicated issue of Palestinians who live in Jerusalem and, their, and their, the issue of their ID and their permits and where they're permitted to reside and where they're not permitted to reside. And the ongoing attempts by the Israeli authorities to take away the Jerusalem ID from Palestinians who live abroad so that they will not be able to come back. When you throw all that into the equation, then what you see, again, is an ongoing, consistent campaign of ethnic cleansing. This is not an occupation where we just want to use the land. This is an ethnic cleansing where Israel wants to rid the, the land of its population and to create a land for the Jews a country with Jews only, or, or, or a vast majority of Jews. In the decades after the 1967 war, there were ample opportunities to make peace based on the two-state solution. And at every, possible, at every point, Israel rejected it. Um, and instead, they preferred to allocate massive resources to further the Israeli military buildup and to build settlements in the West Bank. So, and this, my, uh, my father said this in, 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 a, in a speech uh, about 20 years ago here in the United States, a country that invests in an army and military is not a country that wants peace. It's very simple, especially when we're talking about billions and billions and billions of dollars, the way Israel invests in its army. So this was the, what they opted to do. They opted to build a massive army, and to build settlements in the West Bank and not to negotiate a peace agreement with the Palestinians and not to partition the land, which is what led us to the situation in which we are today. And as I look back at my life growing up as, as, as an Israeli, the way we see our homeland again is everything that happened that wasn't Jewish is trivialized. The only thing that's important is that we were there 2,000 years ago we were thrown out, we were exiled, and now we returned. And everything that's being done now is to connect the past with our present and trivialize anything that happened in the interim, including the fact that half the population are not Jews. That is a big part of it. And again, that ties in once again to the ethnic cleansing. That's why ethnic cleansing is so important. The only way we can make that connection is if there is no other people living there with us who are different. And so the ethnic cleansing is a big part of making that connection, of trivializing not only the culture, not only the history, but the people who live on the land that are not us, that are not Jews. I remember re reading something that Ian Pape wrote, where he says the occupation proceeds from the same ideological infrastructure on which the 1948 ethnic cleansing was erected. In other words, the current Israeli policies in the West Bank are are directly related and part of the same policies that created the ethnic cleansing in 1948, that executed the ethnic cleansing in 48. So there's a direct connection there, and this is really a continuation. One is the continuation of the other. Um, and of course, this explains many, many, thing, many things. Um, and again, going back to the process upon which Israel takes over the land, um, I participated in a protest in Bet Umar just a few weeks ago. They have a weekly Saturday protest. And the process that is taking place there now is that the settlement of Karmei is which, is, which sits on, on, on Bet Umar land, wants to grow. And they want to take more and more of the Bet Umar land, uh, agricultural land. Now, I was there in the spring, and I saw everything in bloom. Um, terraces upon terraces of fruit trees and so on in bloom. It was, it was a beautiful sight. I was there again a few weeks ago and now all the fruit are sitting on the trees. And the army will not permit the farmers to go and, um, and collect the fruit. 
they will not permit them to go and cultivate the land. They will not give them access to go to the land so that everything dies. They can claim that the land belongs to no one and can take over it and keep building Karmaitsur. So during the protest, there were perhaps maybe 15 or 20 protesters, maybe a little bit more. They were walking towards Karmaitsur on the agricultural lands over the terraces and the fruit trees. And the army was already there. And I got there maybe a minute or two after, after the protest. I was a little bit behind. And the army was running amok. I mean, it was incredible to see. You had at least 70, 80, maybe 100 soldiers. You had the Israeli army, and then you had the border patrol or the border police, which is another kind of military unit, but it belongs to the police. And they are ruthless. They are more ruthless than the army. They have a reputation. They're called Mishmar Gvur. And the army was telling everybody to leave. And pretty much everybody was turning around to leave, but that wasn't enough. The soldiers went behind everybody and pushed. And you could see people, and this was, you know, there was rocks and shrubs and, and, and thorns and everything, I mean, on the ground, and the terraces, and they were pushing, brutally pushing everybody around. Um, and they created this, this unnecessary war zone between the handful of protesters and the massive forces that the army brought. And at one point, I was pushed, and I turned around to the soldiers to tell them to stop pushing me. And, I don't know, seconds later, the major who was in command, he was the, the deputy brigade commander, showed up in my face, starting shouting and yelling and man, demanding my ID. And in no time at all, grabbed my thumb, tried to break it, put me in a choke, started yelling at me, and then accusing me of, of uh, assaulting soldiers and accusing me of not willing to identify myself. And everything within seconds, and, and in such a brutal way, and in your face. Um, and of course, with, with an attempt to intimidate. Well, protesters don't get intimidated, and certainly the Palestinians aren't getting intimidated. They go back every Saturday, and they, and they put up with this, and, they, and what happened to me happens to them every week. Um, I did give him my ID pretty much right away. I mean, I argued with him a little bit, uh, wanting to know why he needs my ID suddenly, but I gave him my ID. Um, and then he proceeded to push me, and others pushed me, and we were all eventually pushed down these terraces um, in a way that was not only brutal and unnecessary, but, but dangerous. Could, could, people could fall, people could hurt themselves, but they cared nothing for that. And in the end, you had the soldiers standing up on the terrace, and just, just to understand, the soldiers are fully armed in combat gear. Now they're there to face an unarmed small group of people that are there to wave a flag, walk to a certain place, make a statement, and then go home. This is really the intent. The protests in Betumar are, are uh, clearly nonviolent protests. They're clearly, by definition, and also according to the, to the uh, directives that are given by the organizers, they're nonviolent and they're peaceful marches. And unfortunately, they're not very well attended. Um, but, but there you have it. So the soldiers were standing up on the terrace above the rest of us, and we were standing on the dirt road. Um, by then, I was notified that I was already under arrest and I, shouldn't, and, I, and I shouldn't go anywhere. Of course, they had my ID, they had my passport, so I couldn't leave. And then this exchange began between us on the bottom and the soldiers. And when you look at the soldiers, again, they're fully armed, they've got helmets on, they've got their gear, they've got their guns. It's a hot day, it's, you know, there's dust from all the running and pushing and everything. And they look like they just, they were just victorious in, in some battle, some really serious, difficult battle. And I looked up to them and I, and I said to them, doesn't this look absurd to you? Why are you dressed like this? This is the enemy? I mean, you bring all of, it takes really a hundred soldiers to push down 15, 20 peaceniks with a flag? Is this really what you all signed up to do? And, um, and then I think it was, I, th I thought it was important for them to realize two things. Number one, that what they're doing is illegal. What they're doing is brutal, is unacceptable, and that they will one day pay the price. And I've said this several times when, when facing soldiers in these situations, and I said to them, you need to realize that one day you're all going to go down on your knees and you're going to beg forgiveness from the people of Betumar because thanks to these people, these protests are peaceful. 
thanks to these people, there are no suicide bombers. Thanks to these people, there is no violence to speak of. And you need to go down on your knees and apologize now, because if you don't do it now, you're going to do it later on. And they didn't like that. Um, a couple of soldiers, you know, begged their commanders to, you know, come and get me, and how dare I talk to them like this, and how dare I say this. And I said it again, you guys will all go down on your knees and beg forgiveness for what you've done to these people. Mabet Umar is a town that suffered a lot. Raids and killing of innocent civilians, and, and, and still it's a, it's, a, it's a town that's characterized by, by a leadership that is committed to peace, that is committed to reconciliation, but is also committed to resistance through peaceful means. So it's a very unique place in that regard that there's such a... It's not unique because, because Palestinian resistance by and large is like that, but the concentration of people in Betumar who are committed both to reconciliation and to nonviolent resistance is quite remarkable. And that's why I like to go there. Um, and then the exchange went back and forth and then they started... They went back and claimed, yes, well, you attacked a soldier, you attacked a soldier, and so on and so forth, which of course was absurd. And I said to them also, I said, look at you guys, does it really, you really make, you think it would make sense to anybody to hear that I attacked you? You're fully armed. You're in combat gear. Besides, this is a non-violent protest, by definition, by declaration. And at one point, another soldier said, well, fine, I'll take off my gear and it'll be just you and me, you know, man on man. And I said, no, you don't understand. This is a non-violent protest. Non-violence is a principle. And this principle is what guides these people that come to protest here, that come to march here. They're not going to roll over and die. They're going to come back next week, but the principle remains. You can break people's arms, you can choke them, you can beat them, you can arrest them, but they're going to come back, and if it won't be them, it'll be others. And of course, they didn't like hearing that. And um, another thing that I like to remind them is who I am and who my father was, and that I know what a soldier is, I know what a, an officer is, and I know what a general is. And there were days where the Israeli army fought real armies. Now the Israeli army is fighting nobody. They're not really fighting, they're beating people up. They're brutally oppressing and be beating people up. And again, I reminded them, and the unit that is in charge of these, um, whatever they're called, you know, coming to these protests and, and brutally uh, pushing people around, has a special name. It's called Duchifat or something, which is some kind of an exotic bird. And... Um, and they're very proud of their identity and of their you know, identity as a unit and so on and so forth. And, and I look at them and I said, so this is what you do? It takes all of you in full combat gear to push around 20 peaceniks? Are you that weak? Are you that scared? No wonder people think you're scared. Because if this is what it takes to deal with just a few peaceniks with a flag, then obviously you must be very scared. Which, of course, they didn't like. But, I, but they need to understand that this is what they're saying. Their actions, and these are young, I mean, the soldiers can't be more than 19, the officers are 21 maybe, and if the se more senior officers could be 25, maybe approaching 30. I mean, these are young people. And uh, this particular major, this particular uh, brigade, the uh, deputy commander, was, seemed to me to be particularly uh, brutal and, 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 uh, and vocal and you know, noisy and you know, violent. And then in the end, once, so they determined that I was under arrest. Everybody left, and they took me off to the side, and all the commanders, all the officers were standing by the jeep. And, you know, they began taking off their helmets, and they were wet, sweaty, and they were full of dust. And I said, look at you. You look like you just came back from a real battle. You're pretending like you're real soldiers. What did you actually do? What did you actually do? You ended up with me. I'm the enemy? These 15, 20 peaceniks, or however many there were, these are the enemy? Look at you. You're pretending like you're a real army? And you're not doing anything. All you're doing is pushing around a few peaceniks with a flag. You need to realize you're not an army. You need to realize you're not this, you know, this Israeli army legend that you know, everybody's talking about, that won wars and defeated armies. You're nobody. You're nothing. This is a fake and phony. This is not a real war. And you're not real soldiers. You're a brutal occupying force that's just you know, here to dominate a civilian, by declaration, nonviolent, unarmed population. So they cuffed me and began to, you know, took, off, took my bag, I had a little handbag, took all my stuff out, uh, erased, took my iPhone, erased all the pictures I took, 
my hands were cuffed. I, yeah, I mean, no way I could resist. And they put it in my back pocket, and, and that was it. And then they tra and then and then they when they were done with me, they gave me over to the p civilian police, who then proceeded with the arrest, because I'm an Israeli civilian. And um, and then the police had to make sure that one of the officers would come and actually file a complaint against me. Otherwise, they'd have to let me go, which is what happened in the past. The officers didn't show up, and they had to let me go after several hours without any charges. This time, they came and actually pressed charges. And the charges included uh, assaulting soldiers, refusing to identify myself. And the officer made up this whole story. Now, it wasn't the officer that I was dealing with. That was the major. This was the captain, an entirely different officer how he asked me for my ID and I refused and I pushed him and he pushed me back and finally he had to uh, reach out and pull my ID out of my pocket. Now I was wearing a shirt with no pockets and I said to the police officer, which pocket exactly did he pull it out of? He went behind my, he went behind my back and pulled out my, my, my ID was already with his commanding officer by then, by the time I even saw this guy. It was a complete tall tale that he made up which included a few other he also claimed that I called him Nazi, which I didn't do and I never do. Um, but this was this, but but this was this is their, you know, lying is part of what they do. Brutally pushing around people who have done nothing wrong is part of what they do. And again, I can't help by looking back, you know, 20 or so years ago when I was a young officer and my lieutenant gave me those commands to break the bones of anybody that looks at me and gave me a baton and handcuffs, and I thought. What is he talking about? Well, these young soldiers obviously have had better, you know, better training, better education, because they knew very well what they were doing, and they were, and they, and they believed that what they were doing was the right thing, and they kept challenging me and challenging me, saying to me things like, "Well, if your father was a general, he must be very much, he must be ashamed of you now." I said, "Well, Google his name, and you'll see. He will, he wouldn't be ashamed. You'd be ashamed of you because you guys have brought the Israeli army to the lowest point anybody could possibly imagine." And four decades ago, he said that this would happen. So you are actually living his worst nightmare. And he was one of the founders. He was in the Palmach and so on and so forth. So he carried, he, he, he's the one upon which, he's the generation upon which the legend of the Israeli army or the greatness of the Israeli army was built. And now look at you. You're ashamed.